group um, to summarize um, and, uh, and summarize everything. Um, and then we will wrap up and be out of here as close to 6.30 as possible. Uh, uh -oh. Sorry, guys. Okay. So four questions that I thought we could look at tonight, just as far as giving us some um, context to what I could quickly talk for in 20 minutes that could be the highlight of the report. And there's a handout graphic for you that our, our city department uh, graphic department did that was really neat. Um, and it's called, uh, you know, Golden, Golden's Housing Needs Assessment, A Place to Call Home. It talks about how do we think about housing for all? Um, and these are some of the highlights that I'll be talking to you today. What do the existing markets look like for both rental and home ownership? How have Golden's demographics shifted over the last 10 years and what does that say about our future? What are the projected workforce growth in the next 10 years? So as the city grows, our workforce will grow. And then how does all of this wrap around to inform our future housing needs? The page numbers you see on these slides are the page numbers in the report. So if you really wanna go and have some exciting time, go home, cancel cable, take the report and spend the next week with it. And um, you'll get to read all of this stuff over and over again, because there is a lot of really rich data in there. So the first, um, the first chart I'd like to show you, um, those of you at home can't see the, I mean, those of you here can't, sorry. Um, back, 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 there we go. This is the average single family market and median single family market home price in gold. So from 2015 to August of 2022, this is what our single family home prices look like. So if you bought a home in 2015 for the, for the average price of 500, or average price of $532,000, it's probably worth well over a million dollars today. And so that's great. I was talking to a gentleman the other day. He said, we bought right before COVID. I said, your house is probably doubled in value. He said, yes. If I would try to move into Golden today, I couldn't afford to do it. Um, and that is um, an example of where um, our home prices have gone over the last five years. Um, let's also take a look at rents um, from 2016 to 2020. If I move the mouse down. Oops, no, hang on, sorry. <laughs> it should, but you've got, well, you don't have the slides, so let's see if I can minimize. Okay, technology's telling me to, okay. Um, this is the rents. So if you look at the average rents that we were at in 2016 versus 2021, your average monthly rent in 2016 was about $1,500. The vacancy rate, you can see that there. And then average monthly rent, this is as of the end of 2021. Um, those numbers have gone up. I pretty much can guarantee you that the average rent now is probably over $2,000 a unit. Um, you can see how that compares with all of our other um, communities around us um, with regards to both the increase of those and the vacancy rates and the, the costs. We're probably about $500 above pretty much every other community that surrounds us in, in average rent. Okay, now let's see what I did. Um, so cost burden housing. So one of the key indicators of you know healthy healthy finances, healthy communities. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Thank you. Sorry. Um, one of the um, key indicators is how much you're paying for housing, how much of your income you're paying for housing. So to be cost burdened by the HUD definition is you are paying more than 30% of your income for housing costs. So that's rent, utilities, anything related to housing costs, you're paying more than 30% of your income. So it's also an opportunity for me to introduce a second little handout that Kathy Smith put together for you guys called the average median incomes. So when I reference AMI, what I'm talking about is average median income. So for a family of four living in the Jeffco area, Average median, 100% of AMI or average median income for a family of four is 117,000, I believe on that chart, $200. Um, that's what a family of four making in Jeffco, the average family of four would make. So here, what we show is a household income that's greater than 120% of AMI, about 10% or less of those households are cost burden. It means about 10% of those households are paying less than 30% of their income for rent. 
So 10%, I'm sorry, 10% means, means that 10% or of those households are paying more than 30% of their income for rent. When you get down to the bottom, household incomes greater or less than or equal to 30% of AMI. So you can look on that chart and see where 30% of AMI is. Almost 90% of those households are cost burdened for rent or, or mortgage payment, meaning they're paying more than 30% of their income for either any kind of housing cost, rent, mortgage, whatever it is. Yes, ma'am. They, the HUD updates their incomes every every year. So 2022 would have come out a couple months ago. Sorry, 30% is what HUD says is affordable, should be an affordable housing payment, yes. So what you're seeing on that chart is what does 30% translate to for Jeffco or for, um, for the Jeff, Jefferson County area. And that's been published by the Colorado State Housing Finance Agency. Any questions on this AMI before I leave it? Um, the AMI or the chart? Okay. So let's also talk about our growth of, uh, how, how are we growing as a city? And just from a demographic standpoint, so this kind of gives us a little bit of a, a gray and, and white chart, but if you look at the gray bars, that's where our population was in 2020. So. Our population in 2020 showed by age group, you can see there from the different age groups. And then the blue, the blue bar around them shows in 2020, where is that population? And so you can see the gain or loss in a particular age group um, between 20, 2000 and 2020. So I'll give you a chance to look at that and then let, just let me hit some of the highlights. Um, you can see that our student population, the 18 to 24 population is up by 27%. So we have a lot of growth in that, that younger population, probably attributable to our students. Um, in, the, in the range that's circled here, the 25 to the 54 range is really our workforce families. Those are people who are in the, in the workforce. They're employed. They probably have children um, in, in our community. You can see that we've had declines in those, a bit of a decline in those, um, especially in the 35 to 40, 35 to 54 range, as you see that. It's about a 3% loss over the years. On our senior population, we've had significant increases. You can see our 55 to 64 population has gone up by 166% over those 10 year periods. And our, 60, uh, and our uh, 65 and over population has gone up by 67% during that time period. Just shows you the, the shifts and trends uh, over the last 10 years of how our population has changed. So I thought before we start workforce and we start talking about housing, I try to put some, some definitions around this. So it, as far as the report is concerned, workforce actually means any household who has a, a person and in the workforce. So it's an employed person. We often talk about workforce housing and that sometimes can have a different con connotation. But when we're talking about workforce, it could mean somebody who's working down on, on Washington Street in the restaurants. It could mean a professor at the Colorado School of Mines. So it could be anybody who's, who's employed. As of 2021, the city of Golden had about 19,500 jobs in the city, and that's shifted with the pandemic. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, we are projected to grow um, at different trends, about 1.5 conservatively over the next 10 years. So we'll add about 3,100 jobs to our workforce over the next 10 years. Currently, only 5% of our existing workforce both live and work in the city of Golden. So this is what our workforce has looked like over time. If you start with 2005 and you actually trend up, you can see where the pandemic hit. We were about 21,000 jobs then. Significant drop off um, in 2020 because of the pandemic and we're on our way back up. So you can kind of see that is where, so when I reference 19,500 jobs, I'm referencing this dot over here. Whereas sometimes you'll see 20,000 jobs, that references 2019 data and that's way up there. So here's an example. Um, our workforce, the people who live in Golden, who are in the workforce is about 80, 20, in 2019 was about 8,300. About 7,7300 of those left the city of Golden to work. Um, our workforce, the jobs within the city in 2019, like I said, were about 20,000. And only 956 people who lived in Golden were actually part of that 20,000. 
So we had about 19,314 people that came into the city every day. So we actually kind of more than double, almost double our population every day when people come into work in the city of Golden. So now we're gonna talk about what the report says about housing need. Um, so if you look at the next 10 years with our, in, with our workforce housing growth, with some senior housing growth and the desire for some senior housing, some seniors to downsize, um, we're gonna have different types of housing need. And the projection there on an annual basis is that we would need about 234 workforce units, and that's anybody who's employed. Um, senior units, um, around 60, which represents both seniors that want to downsize, but also seniors who might come and move into the city. And then 15 uh, replacement units, and that's just housing that's aged, not been maintained, that might need to be replaced over time. The second slide, slide shows of all of those new units that we would have to produce, let me get through this one second and then I'll, I'll get to your question. Of all those new units we have to produce, what area median incomes are, are we projecting would move into the city and fill those units? So if you look back to your, eight, your area median incomes, almost half of those new units would need to serve households making at or above 120% of AMI. So if you look at that, we're talking about households that are making $150,000 a year or so. We're talking about half of the new housing units we would need, need to fill um, incomes like that. And then there's other incomes below that, um, the 80%, the 50%, and the below 50% of AMI. And if you really want to get into the report, it will show you how many of those would need to be workforce units, how many of those would need to be senior units, and, uh, and on and on. So let me take your question. Yes. So this is this report, we really tried to get our folks to, our consultants to focus on the city limits of Golden. So the data that we have in here should be very Golden city, city limit specific. So our biggest employees are um, the Taj Mahal, Jefferson County. Um, we have um, Colorado School of Mines. Have, we have uh, Jefferson County Schools has employees here as well. Um, and then of course, us as the city of Golden. Yes, sir. I have a couple questions on the line. Okay. Uh, one of them is, um, is how much is how much the increase of thirty one hundred dollars to be the force tax deduction? Um, yeah, the question is how much of the 3,100 jobs is due to the poorest tech development? So the, the projection of job growth is, and, and you can kind of see this in the report, is really focused on trends that came out of um, uh, COG, it came out of some of the um, employment statistics from the state of Colorado. So it's not, it's, it, and it's really more generalized around the growth of the region. Um, it actually was conservative. They, they actually said that the expected growth in the region would be 2% a year. Jefferson County would be 1% a year. Our, our folks used 1.5% um, to estimate that. So it's not necessarily focused on the new Coors Tech or what Coors Tech might bring in. It's really focused on, you know, traditionally how the growth has happened over the years. Sure. Should I go through the presentation first and, and finish? Okay. Um, yeah, so there is a, there is a um, page in the report that actually shows where all the incommuting is coming from. So it really did, it really did focus on the city limits. So if you're in Arvada, if you're in Lakewood, if you're anywhere outside those city limits, you're considered an incommuter. Um, and uh, let me see if I can, hang on. Uh, hang on just a second. I'm gonna see if I can give you a quick page number on that because I don't wanna violate my time here. Um, check out page um, 44 through 48. And there is a graphic in the report that actually shows where that incommuting is coming from um, that you can kind of see uh, where that is. Okay, we got through that, we got through that one. Okay, just to bring, um, bring this back home to what were our housing prices like? So what are our housing prices like? And I think this also informs what's gonna need to be developed in the coming years. Cause we always think of, if I have done affordable housing now for about 30 years or so, 
Um, you always think about affordable housing or housing that we need to create as being something that serves 80% of area median income or lower. Um, if you look at where we are, our median single family home price is about $900,000. That's, I'm flipping to median now. It's Don's favorite thing to talk about, medians. Median home price is about $900,000. To afford this house with 10% down at 6% interest, the household would need to make $200,000 a year. The median income for a family four in Jefferson County is $117,200 a year. So guess the house prices that we're gonna to have to be helping to target to grow in. For a smaller family, it's 93,800. So we've got a big gap of what, what households can afford to live in Golden if they're going to buy a home right now. Um, and rents, rents are a bit better. Um, a rent for our rental income, we're, we're able to target. Um, I don't know if I did a slide. We're able to target around the hundred percent, hundred and twenty percent, and even if the larger families, we can get down to eighty percent of AMI with existing rents that we have now. Rents are growing like crazy. I think if anybody's seen that, um, you can understand that that's just going to continue to grow um, with regards to that. So um, that's just some statistics for you, and I think that's why you're seeing with regards to the amount of new housing that needs to be developed, 50% of it has to be at or above 120% of AMI. It's because we have this gap. Um, and, and that's a little bit of the challenge. And part of that gap is a supply and demand thing. I mean, we have, we have demand, um, demand well, any economics class you ever took, you probably know that. There's not enough supply, the, the price goes up, whether it's apples or oranges or houses. So there you go. Okay. And then I just wanted to do a little bit here about, this is the back section of the report that takes a lot of reading. Um, I just wanted to do a little bit here about, we analyze or the consultants analyze, they are the financial experts. If we did a different, bunch of different scenarios on vertical mixed use apartments, small infill apartments, attached row homes and vertical mixed use condos, based on the building costs, the land cost, all of that stuff, what percentage of AMI could we re reach based on our current development regulations? And I'm just going to give you an example of that. So what this chart says, is if I build vertical mixed use apartments under our current building regulations, which requires commercial and parking and, and great things like that, 153% of AMI is, the, is what they could financially sell that unit for and, and meet all of their investment requirements. If we changed a couple of those zoning requirements, and I'll talk you through what those changes look like in a second, we could actually get it down to 110% of AMI. So we could make a unit more affordable, not necessarily with changing the unit, but just changing some of the way that the regulations work. Small infill apartments, you can see 140% of AMI could be shifted to 105% of AMI if we change the, the regulations a little bit. So let me read. Let me give you an example of, of what those two look like. And I have to have my glasses on for this. I'm okay, so the vertical mixed use apartment 1A assumes that there's 90 units, assumes 25% commercial requirement, which we have in our zoning code um, when you're building um, in uh, commercial to residential, and one and a half parking spots per unit. If we shift that to vertical apartments mixed use 1B, our unit count goes up a bit, 135 units instead of 90 units, 5% commercial, and one parking spot style per unit. But by making those shifts in the way we have our regulations, we're able to make it more affordable to develop, and then they can reach the, the more affordability. Um, in the small infill apartments, which is your second example, small infill apartment A assumes 13 units, 25% commercial, and 1.65 styles per unit. And that would reach someone at 148% of area median income. Small infill apartments, to get to 105%, we change our, adjunct, we change our assumptions. We go up a bit in units, 35 units instead of 13, 0% commercial, and 1.15 styles per unit. So those are examples of how if we do some shifting in, in the way that our zoning requirements are, um, that in uh, none of these scenarios assume anything more than three or four stories. We're not talking like a mountain of 20 story buildings. Um, these are all still low rise apartments, but being able to do some shifting in that makes it the, the development cost lower and us able to reach a more affordable um, household. So I will go you through the 
through the rest of those for you because I'm probably, yep, I'm at my point. So here's your four takeaways that I'm going to leave you with before you start your discussions. Homeownership in Golden is likely unreachable for households at or below 150% of area median income as we stand today. Rentals in Golden are currently affordable to smaller households right at around 100% of area median income. And it seems like the smaller households are the ones that we're, we're seeing uh, more of the growth in. Over the last 10 years, there has been a significant growth in our senior households and a decrease in our workforce households. Um, projected new housing needed for workforce seniors and replacement units um, are at approximately 310 units per year. And our cost to develop new housing in Golden based on current direct development regulations make it hard to reach housing at or below 150% of area median income. So I will leave you with that. Um, Don, do you want me to try to ask, answer the 20 questions in the chat? <laughs> Let me see what I can do. I'm gonna pull them up here so everybody can see. Okay. Yes, 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 everybody can hear. That's great. Um, you can repeat the questions if you missed. Um, the 3,100 jobs, I think we talked about that one, Coors Tech. It's not necessarily tied to Coors Tech. The report on, is neutral on who is doing the hiring. It is just a projection. So there's no clear answer on how many of those would be Coors Tech specifically No. It is a projection using data that comes from uh, all of the, uh, both the state, the federal uh, growth projections, as well as our own COG projections for employment growth in Jefferson County in the Denver metro area, and then narrowed down specifically to Golden. Uh, and again, all of this is just data and projections. We can't guarantee, you know, we're not gonna have another pandemic and everything's gonna change, or, you know, things, something else will come in and change it dramatically. And that's why the affordable housing community is so important because they have, they'll have the golden perspective to be able to take a look at this data and say, what should we really address? We're not gonna be able to address all of this. So what is it that we really should address? Um, are the community numbers just based on the city limits? Uh, okay, I think I've answered that one. Um, and again, those community numbers came directly from, from the COG folks. The COG uh, transportation team does a, a, a wonderful job of understanding in community and out community throughout the, the um, Denver metro area. So you can actually go and look at that as well as look what's in the report on that. Um, please repeat the questions in the room. Okay. Did I, was there a, okay, was there a question in the room? I wonder that I didn't repeat the these questions. Uh, there was the one about what we can reflect the city um, from lookout or okay. the in commuting. Okay. So, yeah, the in commuting, um, again, we try to keep this very golden specific. We're reliant on a lot of our agencies to, um, to give us that data um, and do that. So, Don, are you echoing? Rita, that's it. Did we get it? Okay, yes, I can share the slides. Okay, so let me market the Guiding Golden page real quick while I have a chance. Um, the Guiding Golden page, which Kathy has given you a QR code link to, uh, has the report in it. It has the presentation slides that we use to report to council. I will upload this presentation to that Guiding Golden page. And then as the affordable housing, Kathy's holding up. So Kathy's got a, there's a QR code if you're in the room. If not, if you go to the Guiding Golden page on the Guiding Golden website and search for housing needs and strategies assessment, that page has the final, final report on it, all 120 pages of it or so. Um, it has the uh, slides that we've used. Um, I'll put these slides from today up, um, we can. And then any, as the Affordable Housing Committee starts to work on, do their work to analyze this, I will try to keep that page updated with their work as well. Um, so that we can continue to, you know, receive um, conversation and discussions. My cards are in the back with my email address on it. So you can also email me anything you'd like to share, and I'll be happy to feed that back in. It's, yes, ma'am. Janice, right? Yeah. Is there, um, there must be so much money in the community. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question is, there's only so much land in the city of Golden. What are the plans to annex other areas? I don't know. <laughs> it is not my job to do that. However, that is something that has come up in several conversations that maybe annexation is a possibility. That's what the policymakers will have to decide. And that's certainly something that if, 
if the Affordable Housing Committee recommends that out, council could consider that as a possibility as well. Yes, ma'am. Okay, a number of years ago, people complained to me. I was going to go with no. And I And it's certainly important. Water water issues are certainly important when you're looking at how do you build new housing. Yeah, and all of those things have to come into play. So it's it's definitely not. I've got to wrap myself up here, um, but it's definitely not not something that's done lightly. Which is why that council felt it very important to to create a committee that would study this in depth and not just do it something really quickly. So um, I, I I totally understand your your statement there. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, I want to kick off the breakout. Session. Okay, so, we'll have more time to talk. Yeah. Okay, those of you online, we did see your questions. They're definitely valuable and hopefully we'll get back to them. Um, but right now I want to have people have a chance to talk amongst themselves about what they've learned and what other questions they might have. Uh, you might direct your attention to the graphic that I'm showing here. This is one of the graphics that you guys were linked to. Um, and, and then also find this sheet with the questions. Select person at your table who can take notes and is willing to do a readout. Um, but basically we want to figure out, you know, what are your further questions? And we will be sure to repeat those um, to those of you on Zoom. So at this point, we're going to kick off the breakout rooms. And you too have the same task, which is to um, elect a leader to um, speak back to the group. So we'll do this for about 15, 20 minutes. All right, so let's, let's make that happen. And I'm watching the clock, so at about 10 of, I'll check in and see how those conversations are going. Um, but let's interact, let's, let's learn from each other. We have enough people in each room. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, welcome back to the live meeting. All right, so if you're online and not muted, if you could mute yourselves until you're um, welcome back, I'd appreciate it. Um, thank you. So thank you. That was a really lively discussion. I, I love seeing the animation and, and everybody uh, participating. I wanna honor the people that have been online and we're in their little groups and we haven't gotten to hear from them much. So I'm hoping that uh, people who were chosen as speakers would drop their name in the chat 
and we could see who is going to speak for, we had three breakout groups. So um, you could potentially just unmute yourself and then we're gonna test the ability to hear you over a mic and I'm gonna to have to mute myself so we don't get feedback. So is there somebody, okay, Mary and Greg. Okay, great. So I'm gonna mute myself and then ask Mary to unmute and, and give us a readout. Um, we could go through all the questions but that would be a lot of time. So let's start with Mary and the first question um, on the breakout. What information did you, did you get out of the graphic from Golden Housing Needs Assessment and what's surprising to you? Yeah, so it, that one uh, pretty much consensus, the, the decrease in younger children that you know ages up to age nine and elementary school age children, that was a surprise um, for folks. Um, as well as that increase in older adult populations. Um, I chimed in as an elder millennial myself. I'm not as surprised about um, the decrease in younger children in, in the community, just amongst my peer groups. Um, and then we, we pretty much moved on to that second question quickly, but um, yeah. Yep, go ahead and give us one of your top two priorities, um, and then I'll go on to another person from the Zoom. Yeah, so uh, uh, th there was discussion of this, um, this some of the conflict between, you know, the vitality or this nurturing home that is golden, why we choose to live here versus codes and regulations and parking and, um, you know, the hip and cool golden that it is now. So it's very much there's this dichotomy within these challenges and we can't, you know, can't have either or. And so there's a lot of tension within, within that, um, you know, how do we, how do we deal with that conflict? Um, how do we make it so we can continue to live here? People with young families can continue to come here. So um, that was a big part of our time was number two. Great, thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna move on to Loretta and uh, ask you the same two questions. Um, what was your big surprise and one of your priorities? Well, I think our biggest surprise was that we didn't have the questions. So <laughs> we just did a freewheeling conversation and I think um, I would quote our group as saying that the biggest surprise is that the city appears to believe that everybody needs to live within the city limits to work here when Golden is geographically limited in size. Um, we question that basic premise that everybody needs to live here. Um, we weren't surprised that many of us aged in the last 20 years so that when there were a lot of people in the younger age bracket that bought homes 20 years ago, that now we live in our homes and we're 20 years older. That wasn't a surprise. But overall, I think our conversation focused on thinking that some of the base assumptions of the conversation are not sound. Okay, thank you for that. Um... Okay, let's go on to uh, Greg and if, whether you had the questions or not, hopefully you've got a heads up now. Um, what was your surprise or takeaway? And then uh, what would be a top priority for you for the city to address? All right, I just muted there. We did have the questions. We got a little bit <clears throat> sidetracked as these things uh, tend to, to do. Um, and I think, we were very similar to Loretta's group in that we questioned some of the base assumptions that the consultant study, um, you know, uh, started with, which is to say that cities areas should be not providing, but there should be enough housing in a particular region for everybody that works in that region. It just doesn't seem possible or even logical. I mean, I don't generally work in Golden. Um, you know, my real job is in Denver, and 
I don't know if there's an assumption that I should therefore live in Denver. Uh, the math just doesn't seem to add up if people should geographically, you know, there should be enough housing for each person that lives in a particular area. Um, I think another hot topic within our group was parking, which, you know, some of the data that we were looking at early in that, um, the PowerPoint presentation, a lot of the ways that they were going, you know, showing to decrease the unit cost for development was by decreasing the number of required parking spaces. And that seemed somewhat ludicrous to uh, parts of our group that are already seeing challenges in parking throughout the city. Um, so depending on where these kinds of things are being built, it uh, doesn't really seem like a realistic assumption that we can, you know, build uh, with fewer parking spaces. And yeah, I'd say that's probably our main crux of our discussion. All right. Well, great. That was great. And I'm going to have um, people in the room come up and then they can be recorded and in the microphone. So uh, let's, I see you're working your way up here from the back table. Okay. So while there were, you know, four questions and it's really important why people chose to live here. Um, if we don't get to that 30 second or 60 second conversation about what you learned, I hope everybody takes that back into the community. That's why I put that on there is so that you could take that back into the community uh, yourself. So with that, let me turn it over to, and be sure to introduce yourself again. Hi, my name is Beth Woodard, and I live in Mesa Meadows 3, and I was surprised to learn that I live in a home that's over the median price. I think that was a real shock to us, that the median price of a home was $900,000. Um, that was considerably more than I, I, I ever thought, and I think the table as well. Uh, so uh, also, surprising to us was that um, one of the things we have to do, as all of you who studied this, we have to understand is the land, <clears throat> land use regulation. Um, you know, we can't go up Table Mountain because there was a road there once, <laughs> they were building and it collapsed. And it's obviously, we can't go any higher than it already is. So that's a problem. Um, also, Another regulation is that you have to have water tanks um, if you go, for example, north of Golden and probably elsewhere too, if we're talking about Lookout Mountain. Um, how can we provide housing for all people who are commuting to Golden or it, it just might not be feasible? Um, we just can't, there isn't the land number one, but is it, is it realistic? It used to be that all firefighters, for example, had to live in Bowdoin. That is no longer a rule for obvious reasons. Um, so uh, I think Charlene explained well uh, to the audience before that uh, uh, when Pleasant View wanted to, to be incorporated, that there were just too many infrastructure issues with Pleasant View, and we'd have to address that, the, <clears throat> the dirt alleys, although I know we have some golden um, and, and things like that. Um, the two priorities, um, this is uh, question number two, um, how, do, how do we protect the affordable units we do have? And we do need to build some more, that's, that's so obvious. Uh, how can we prevent developers from coming in and doing what they do in Denver and, and here, quite frankly, but mostly in Denver? We see where they do scrape offs and build mini mansions in a how, in a, on a street that you know, was nice, affordable housing at one time. So that's one of the questions. Some of these are, Philosophical, for example, um, uh, when we consider people who work here, the seniors, for example, who are 
quote unquote aging in place, um, do we value the volunteer work that they do? Is that considered work um, when they, they work at the museum 40 hours a week or that kind of thing? So that needs to be considered too, I think. I don't, <laughs> um, I had a table where there were seniors and there were people in their 40s. So it, uh, it seemed to affect us all. Um, I guess one of the things we've also heard is uh, our seniors, a disposable group. And that's, um, that was one of the priorities we, we did discuss um, that, that maybe they're not. Um, the, last, the last one was if you had 30 seconds, how would you explain what you learned? And that was vote prop one, two, three. Um, and uh, that's preservation. So preservation is, you know, a big key to all this too. Um, why did we choose? Um, most of us moved here because of jobs. Um, all of us, as a matter of fact, and none of us could afford to live here. I mean, to move here now with the housing price. Thank you very much. Yes. First two, okay. So my name is Kevin Nichols. We had a mighty group of four people over here discussing the questions. On the first one, uh, I guess what struck us the most about the graphic and data sheet was uh, housing's really not affordable, either rental housing or home ownership type of housing. Um, some of the surprising things to us was just how fast rents have increased and how fast home, home prices have increased. And just the, the number of people that commute into our city to, to work that don't live here. That was surprising to us. And then priorities, we, we, we thought work out, workforce housing was important and uh, we didn't really get into a discussion of how much you could do. And I think it's probably quite a realistic thing that you could ever you know, try to address all the workforce needs. But I think the more important question is, should we be trying to address some of that at least? You know, Maybe it's 10% of the, the people that are now commuting that can't live in our community. And then we also got into some discussion uh, about how we shouldn't uh, ignore some of the lower income groups. There's been a lot of discussion about you know, the workforce housing, the 80 to 120% AMI, but what, what about those people that are truly poor, you know, and, and they can't afford to live in our community? So that's what we discussed. Thank you very much. And just as a note, they have my group that included Colorado School Mines, which is, so that's my group. Hi, folks online and uh, all equally great people in the room. My name is Marjorie Sloan, and I represented a very diverse table. Um, so our response to the first question about what information did you get out of the data presented and how surprising was it? In general, it was that the facts on area median income and our housing costs are staggering. Bethany's word and a good one, staggering. <laughs> um, but also that this data confirmed everybody's intuitive impression that housing in Golden is unrealistic for many folks who would like to be in our community. That's question one. Um, question two, we had the same tension that the other groups have, have had between um, what are the expectations for the city's contribution to housing and um, should the city changes regulations you know, from what we all expect now um, to include and welcome and make feasible for people who work in Golden, which are 
often service jobs and not certainly even approaching the median income. You know, what, how, how is it and what are the expectations of the city to include those folks in our housing market? Um, we had a great conversation, but I'm gonna leave it right there. Thank you. Hi Zoomies, my name is Mandy. Um, we also had a wonderful discussion and for our first one, we were most surprised by the amount of in and out commuters um, was shocking to us. Uh, similar to what other folks have said, the distance between the price of housing and incomes locally. Um, and then we had some discussion around the rentals would be 150 AMI and below, um, but availability and existence might be different. Um, is that correct? Okay. Uh, priorities moving forward, as Tony pointed out, which was a wonderful way to start our conversation around priorities is what do we want for the Golden community? Um, and we had a discussion about more housing density um, can we do more stories and subdivision of lots? Um, there is a, is a desire for more economic, cultural, and racial diversity in our community. Um, and recognizing that there's a lot of wonderful reasons to move here. And there, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons to be here. Um, and then we had similar echoing some of the parking concerns. So my name is Matt I'm from the table over here, and um, I think what was surprising was the impact of regulations and the lack of affordability for golden employees. And then a few priorities. One was um, helping people buy homes so that people that move here can um, participate in, in that equity building. Uh, addressing it as a regional solution, kind of bringing uh, everyone on the front range and maybe in the state involved because housing is a challenge for the entire front range area. And we're hearing even places like Rocky Flats, Rocky Ford, thank you, not Rocky Flats. <laughs> They're building housing up there. Um, yeah, so that's about it. Thanks. Uh, those of you on Zoom maybe can't see on the screen that we have been seeing your comments and, and they're echoing a lot of what we've heard in the room and we super appreciate it. Uh, I'm gonna bring Janet back up here. Uh, she's actually got some preliminary answers or these comments on some of the things that have been said so far. And, um, and then we'll open it up to some more questions. So one of the things that came up is how do we house everybody in Golden who works in Golden? And the answer is you're right, you can't. There is no way we can house the people who work in Golden, all of them um, in Golden. Um, right now, 5% of workforce in Golden lives in Golden. So that's about 975 households that work in Golden live in Golden. If we build these other 2,340 households, and assuming everybody who moves into that workforce household also lives in, works in Golden and lives in Golden, the most we could get to is about 15% of our workforce actually living in Golden. So we'll never be able to get to, to house everybody in Golden who works in Golden. And I, I, don't, I don't think that can be done. I think, I think even, and even if you build all 2340 units over the next 10 years that's projected to need for workforce, and that's for the Affordable Housing Committee to decide how that gets done, um, you're likely not to have all of them occupied by people who also work in gold. So um, just, to, just to kind of clarify that, because it seemed like that was, that was getting confused a bit. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I love this conversation. I, I love Mary's comment here. You know, it is a challenge. It's a supply and demand challenge. Is that if we continue to have million dollar homes and that's all that you can have, you're gonna have, um, you may have really great community, really great community, very wealthy people. Um, I like somebody saying about senior volunteering, um, the, the, the impact of volunteers on your community. And when you live in a community and, and you, 
either work or your kids go to school in a community, you are much more likely to be involved in that community on a volunteer basis. And that really helps build that community spirit. And you guys know that because you've lived in Golden and you've seen that happen over the years. So somehow creating that balance and creating that right balance. And I don't have the right answers. This is just the beginning start of the piece. Um, and it will be it will be explored and investigated um, going forward by the affordable housing committee, and then ultimately council will have to say, you know, what's the right direction, what right policies, um, positions do we need to put in place to create something that makes sense for building out of all of this. So, do you want me to address additional questions, or how can I help? Go to can you comment on the affordable housing committee and what their role will be? Right. Um, so the if you watched the last council session, or maybe it's even the one before. Sorry. If you watched the last council session, there was a resolution, and you can go back and read that resolution. It's resolution 2882. It talks about the affordable housing committee, the creation of that affordable housing committee, what the composition of that committee will look like, what their role will be, and what the reporting back to council responsibilities will be. So it's the goal is to try to get a balance of folks, um, some from Golden, some may not necessarily be from Golden, because if we're one of the one of the ideas is to have an affordable housing developer on there, who can help understand the challenges of developing affordable housing in the city and can give us some feedback on what what might need to what recommendations might be good um, to um, have to counsel to, to encourage or, or better make available the ability to develop affordable housing. Uh, 2882, I believe it's, it's on the consent agenda from the last council meeting. So if you go back to the last council agenda, you'll see uh, on the consent agenda, the creation of an affordable housing committee. And there's two or three pages in that resolution that talks about their responsibilities, what they're tasked with doing, um, and what the composition of that committee might look like. So, <laughs> correct, sorry, October 11th. <laughs> they go so fast. So. Yes, sir. Um, in talking about how to expand uh, affordable housing, uh, I, I thought of this, and, and maybe it's not today that nobody spoke of earlier, but there was a rejection of a plan to adopt Pleasant View into the city because it might cost taxpayers and mm -hmm. older money. Okay. Somehow the community has to be brought to the idea that to bring others in means that something's going to have to be given up. Maybe it's the price of housing will continue to rise exponentially in Golden, but those who are here have to have to get on board with the idea, and that's a tough political thing to do. I understand. Uh, and that's just a comment. And I've loved all the good ideas tonight. I don't think there's been a bad idea shared. And I appreciate all of you for um, providing input to, to, to the thought of this. So, yes, sir. Are you able to share some of the recommendations and strategies that are in the report that the consultant came up with? I can do my best. I don't have them for you. Let me repeat the question because the people online are yelling at me right now for not repeating questions. Um, the question was, are we able to, to, to um, um, share some of the strategies and recommendations that the um, uh, re the report recommended that the, the consultants recommended um, so that one of them was to form an affordable housing committee um, to further investigate this. So there's there is lots of things. Partnerships with nonprofit organizations like land trusts are a great example. Um, if you want to, the report talks about what land trusts can do, but it's a really great there's a lot there's nonprofits out there. Um, Elevation Land Trust is a great example where they buy the land and it takes the, and, and hold the land for 99 years and then build houses on it. And what that does is it takes the cost of the land out of the resale and you can always resell them to another affordable person. So it gives um, folks who are at the lower AMI levels the opportunity to own land or to opportunity to own a home to build a portion of the equity. There's equity sharing in that um, to build a portion of equity and then move on to their next home that way. It gets them into the starter homes that we don't probably have a lot of starter homes in Golden. So um, that's, uh, that's a great um, question. Um, some of the other ones are to look at the development regulations that we talked about tonight to see whether or not there could be some concessions made in the different development regulations. And again, if you look at the Affordable Housing Committee structure, 
some of the people on there are going to be planners. They're going to be developers. They're going to be able to give us some feedback on what does it cost to um, build in Golden? What concessions could we have or, or not have? Not all of them will be that. Some will be residents that can come back and say, no, with parking, parking, you know, we need parking. So you'll have uh, ideally a, an eclectic group of people that can give us all different positions. And ultimately the committee will kind of think through all those positions and, and come up with that. Um, I've got questions online too. So let me try to, to capture those. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to call on someone and I'm gonna mute myself. Is that correct, sir? Okay. I'm gonna call on ML. ML, how are you, ma'am? Oh, very good. Thank you. I was uh, typing my question, but I'm glad you called on me. <laughs> Thank you. So um, my question is, I feel like we could, one thing we need to do is, is maximize the units that we do have, maximize the benefit to the community. And I'm talking specifically about the affordable housing units that have been uh, funded at least partially or maybe fully by the housing authority. And why, my question is, why don't we income qualify them annually. When I asked that question of the executive director, uh, she said, oh, no, no, once you get into these units, you're basically in forever, as long as you want to stay there. So they don't income qualify every year. And I thought those units, such as the flats at Ford and uh, Lewis Court, were built so that hopefully people could eventually get more training or a better paying job, such of the ones that can. Of course, there's some, some people there that are disabled or, or not able to do that. But of the ones that can, the goal should be to help them get to the next step and then be able to go into other housing and, and allow someone else to come in behind them. Why is that that we, and, and how can we change that? Let's, let's, let's look at it positively and say, Let's figure out how we can change that. And that would make more room for some of the people that we're, we're talking about. Let me try to answer that. And, and there's a lot of different affordable housing programs. So there's often complications to them. You generally, uh, someone's rent is tied to about 30% of their income if they're in affordable housing. So as their income grows, their rent's going to grow. And generally, there's a point where people step out and say, it's easier for me to be in a market rate unit because my rent's just going to keep going up, 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 and I can get step into a market rate unit um, more if it, and, and, and just pay market rent. It's going to be cheaper than 30% keeping going up and up and up. Um, I have to look at the tax credit housing. I had to, I'd have to look at exactly how those are structured. Um, every, there's lots of different types of financing, and they all come with different types of rules. But generally, in affordable housing, if you are in an affordable housing unit, you're paying 30% of your income for rent. As your income increases, your rent increases. And so the next natural step would be to step into a market unit. Now, what does that say for Golden if we don't have step-up units? So if, if we have only units that can serve people who are at the 30, 60%, and then we jump to people units that can serve 100 and 120%, we have a gap in the middle that either forces people to stay way down here or stay down way, way down here longer, um, as opposed to being able to step their way up into market housing. And, and we all have experienced the ability of, to own a home, um, to, to move through um, the cycles of being young and being able to move up into housing. And to have those, those steps of housing in a community really gives us the ability to grow within a community. I, I would agree. But what I was told by the executive director on two different occasions, both in public meetings, is that there is no, uh, no checking of the income once they get in there. I mean, that she's very clear on that. Lori, Rosen. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have to, I'm, I'm happy to follow up with Lori. I know her well. Um, I'm not exactly sure again what the flats on Ford's uh, structure is, if they have what their vouchers are, if they even have vouchers, if they're just using tax credit funds in that housing. So, and if then could, I, I have. If you could clarify that and get let us know what let that me, is. Let me try to find that out. I also yeah. have to put a plug in for our navigator program because one of the things our navigator does is actually work with people through case management to try to actually help them find jobs, help their incomes go up and things like that. So, yes, sir. Okay, let me start with Don in the back. He had his hand up first. Yeah. Oops. Nan, would you unmute? I am unmuted. Can you hear me? Um, I was wondering how the 
growth of Colorado School of Mines is, and the, how it affects the city of Goldman. I mean, it affects it tremendously. And a lot of the quote, affordable housing in Golden and little apartments and rooms was taken up by students. Thank you for that question. Um, it's very important. Um, one of the recommendations that did come out of the study was to, to create a partnership with the Colorado School of Mines to work toward housing. There are currently about 3,500 student beds and on-campus housing at Colorado School of Mines, and there are 7,000 students. So we have about 4,500 students that don't, not necessarily live in Golden, but live somewhere in the, the area close to Golden in housing. And yes, it does affect the affordability of other housing that's available. Um, when we, we are not able to provide adequate housing for all of our, our Colorado School of Mines folks as well. So uh, it is an important piece of this discussion is how do we have partner with them to help get the on-campus housing or the student housing, availability of student housing increased. I have another question. How would you keep married students and married families not applying to affordable housing in Golden. How do you keep married students and married families from not applying to affordable housing in Golden? Um, again, I'm gonna have to confirm this, but my, my understanding of the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, which is what funds the afford formal affordable housing in Golden, is that if you're a full-time student, you cannot, you're not eligible for the Low Income Housing. What about, what about if you're a graduate student or a student or a student or a student? Again, I'd have to check. I, my understanding is if you are, if the definition is a full-time student. It, I don't think it calls out graduate students or not graduate students. Okay, I've got one in the room. Can Ken ask a question, Don? Don's the mediator. Okay, I will repeat Ken's question. Yes, sir. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I haven't been involved in that one as much. Um, and uh, one, one thing that we do have, though, right now in the state is we have about 600 million this year. In, um, and it's the most amount of affordable housing funding that's ever been committed by the state of Colorado in total. So $600 million this year in affordable housing funding that, that has been appropriated uh, by this legislative government. So it is it's something, and someone brought up Proposition 123. All great ideas because they're affordable housing funding that can be brought into the community um, to say, okay, do we identify pieces of land that could be used for affordable housing and maybe we could use those funds to purchase them or can we partner with a nonprofit and use some of these funds uh, to actually help develop affordable housing? So there's a lot of funding right now in the legislative sessions to try to help do that. My job is to help try to figure out how much of that funding we can get into the city of Golden. So did you wanna say something? I just say that yes, things are happening on that property behind the scenes, but as she said, it comes down to funding and getting it allocated. But also the governor is huge on making use of any public lands and pushing that they be made available for housing across the state. So it's not just look out. By the way, to clarify for Charlotte, the land between where where the bike races happen on Wednesday nights, it's it's between Lookout Mountain School and Fossil Trace. That gap is about 13 acres. Uh, but we are approaching the end. So I think I saw a hand over here for Janet, but I want to wrap it up. And actually, I think uh, online it said it was going to end at 6:25. So we're really close. Um, so what we'll do is we'll take the chat and we will look through and make sure we answer the questions. And if we didn't, um, we will do so and probably post those on Guiding Golden uh, with, along with the PowerPoint from tonight. You're welcome to take any of the papers. 
and take that 30 second and 60 second talk about what you learned tonight back into your community. So as Bill said, we can start that education that needs to happen of we've got to do something and we've got to bring the community along to do so. So thank you very much. Yeah, if you want to leave your notes, um, Kathy will absorb those. So thank you very much. If you are online and you were a group leader and you have notes that you can provide, can you email them to Kathy Smith, please? And she's going to try to consolidate everything. We're also going to try to consolidate the chat as well. Thank you all for your time.